Welcome to my presentation on From Remote Fruit to What's Async Fruit. Happy to be here at Open Source Summit. My name is Isabel Trostprom. I'm Open Source Strategist at Europis AG. I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation and a co-founding member of the InnoSource Commons. I also created Berlin Buzzwords, which is a conference on all things search, scalable and data analysis. Now, for a decade, this conference ran as an on-site conference. Like many other events this year, it moved to an all-remote format organized by a little agency in Berlin called Plain Schwarz, who did, a, did an awesome job moving a conference that lived from a lot of hallway conversations and socializing into a digital format. I also created FOSS Backstage, which, which is a conference on all things open source, but behind the scenes, think of licensing, think of governance, think of community management. Also, this conference is going to be remote first in 2021. Um, call for presentations is still open, so if you have ideas, if you want to share what you're doing in your communities, um, looking forward to, to your submissions. Now, a lot of the ideas in these presentations are based on what I learned at, at the Apache Software Foundation. In particular, at a, at a, at a presentation at ApacheCon in 2008, back in Amsterdam, which happened to be my very first ApacheCon ever. It was a t talk by Bertrand de la Cretas on asynchronous decision making. So if you're interested in diving deeper into this topic, I would like to invite you to head over to YouTube after my presentation and watch Bertrand's video on asynchronous decision making, why and how. Now throughout my presentation, there will be different interactive parts. We will use an, an etherpad, etherpad for you, where you as the audience can collaborate on answering some of the questions around moving towards asynchronous communication and decision making. You don't need to write down this URL right now. You can head over to it and have a peek into what the questions will be like. But I will show the URL again on all of the slides which have questions on them. Let's get started right away. When thinking about remote working, um, what is the first sentence that you think of when hearing remote first? I will give you a couple minutes to think about that, head over to the other pet and together with all of the other people in the audience, um, try to brainstorm on what the first sentence looks like when you hear remote first, either during the pandemic or during your open source development or even in a corporate setting. Ready, steady, go! One more minute to go.
Okay. Now, before going through this talk, I also talked to some of my friends and colleagues what their remote working experience looked like. So here's the answers that I got. There was one human telling me, I lost all flexibility. We moved all pairing to video conference sessions and we pair all the time. It's exhausting. I'm on back-to-back -back conference calls all the time. It's worse than on-site meetings. What could have been an email still is a video conference. It's chaotic. I'm making time for the conference call, but it doesn't have an agenda or even moderation. But there's also different feedback that I got. I managed to get more done. There are less distractions. Colleagues moved to another country. Remote worked. So what is the difference between these teams? In order to figure out what happened, we will first have a look at which types of communication you will you have in an, in your typical office. There is a coffee machine chat, which happens to be incidental, unplanned, um, which also is very informal and which helps still helps information to flow from team member to team member, but also across team boundaries. Plus, it helps with bonding team members together because they don't necessarily only talk work topics. There is pairing where a lot of um, mentoring happens, but also knowledge sharing on how coding, how a certain piece of code works. There's team communication happening at the desk, which is mostly informal, but very fast and very speedy in order to get feedback. If you have a question, ask your um, team members and you will very quickly be able to move on. But there's also formal team communication. Think about um, scrum stand-ups, think about planning sessions, review sessions, etc. There's also cross-team meetings. Think about architectural uh, synchronization sessions, um, thinking, th thinking time time deadlines between dependent teams, etc. But there's also company all hands meetings where there's one human standing in front of everyone else, sharing updates, sharing plans, everyone else mostly listening, like in a um, presentation setting. But there's also lunch breaks, very informal. Sometimes people talk about the work, sometimes they don't. Much like the coffee machine, lunch breaks mean that information can flow across team boundaries, but also team members are being bonded together. And that at much lo longer sessions than what happens next to the coffee machine. So with that in mind, with all of those different types of office communication in mind, think about which purposes for communication you can think of. Could be mentoring, could be teaching, what else is there? And after that, think about which properties of communication can you think of? Think about confidential versus transparent. Which other properties are there? I will give you again three minutes to think about that. Um, the Etherpad URL still is in the lower right corner. And we will go through that and think about how to move that to a online first or remote first setting.
Okay. Some of the um, purposes of communication that you could have thought of are, for instance, giving feedback to someone. That's something that within an open source project we are fairly used to. Think of um, pull requests coming in where you give feedback on um, how to improve the, feed the um, pull request. There's also the purpose of socializing. Think about the coffee ma machine chat. But there's also things like resolving conflict, which is um, harder to do in a written only context. There's also things like making decisions. Think about moving to um, towards one architectural um, path. But there's also things like teaching, motivating people, or simply sharing information. Now, if you think about different communication channels that we are used to in open source projects, it could be um, something that is either archived or it's something that could be deniable. For project decisions, architectural decisions, all of these should be archived. But some of the conversations um, likely should be deniable. Think about someone sharing with you where that project is being used, um, where the user themselves doesn't want to disclose to the wider public that they are using that project, but they still want to be involved and they still want to contribute to it. Think about communication being transparent versus private. Um, technological decisions, process decisions, all of those likely should be transparent. But once it goes to um, people decisions, um, personal feedback, that's something that should be private. Communication channels also can be either high bandwidth or low bandwidth. Think about meeting face-to-face -face over lunch. That's re very high bandwidth. You see um, faces of people. You see what they are doing with their hands. You see what they are doing with body language. A lot of that is missing in typical open source communication, which is tends to be um, written first. So the goals of remote first should be to gain flexibility, both in terms of location and in terms of time. So we shouldn't simply take office communication um, and move it as is to remote con communication, simply replacing face-to-face -face communication with video calls. This won't give us the full potential. Still, we want to transform office communication to take digital alternatives, but likely we will have to take different paths. What we also want to achieve as a byproduct is to increase innovation speed through transparency. Think about how communication changed in science during the pandemic. Instead of going through a lengthy publication cycle, scientists shared um, research results as quickly as they could on preprint surveys. That meant that a lot more um, conversations were made public. It also meant that a lot more uh, mistakes were made public. But it also meant that innovation could move way faster than any time before. For the general public, it also meant getting used to scientists making mistakes. It also meant that publications that before had the reputation of being correct and well-checked suddenly meant that there could be errors in there and the entire um, quality process was transparent and visible as well. So we have to learn that making mistakes is okay for as long as we work to correct these mistakes as we move along. So step one, we want to convert in project communication. This is what I observe in a lot of um, typical software engineering projects. If you have a question around architecture of component X, typically the answer is go to Bob, he has the answer. Or it's about go to Alice, she knows who, why this was implemented. Essentially, this boils down to mass media where everyone has to talk with everyone. This scales very well up to a team which is roughly two pizza sized. But it doesn't scale much larger than that because um, connections grow exponentially and we've learned during this pandemic what's, what exponential growth looks like. Open source does that slightly differently. 
especially in Apache projects, what you have is a central hub of communication where everyone goes to in order to ask questions, in order to coordinate, and in, in, and in order to make decisions. And Apache those typically are mailing lists. One of the pro some of the properties that this communication ha hub has to have is that it's public and transparent for everyone, that it's archived, and that it's archived is searchable. Plus, that every message sent to that um, communication hub can be referenced with a unique URL that is stable over time. So we want to replicate this. We want one hub that everyone communicates in. Of course, in a um, typical setting, you do not have just one project. You have multiple projects, say Project Unicorn and Project Kitten. Both of these projects have their own hubs with um, team members communicating through that hub. Now, what happens if Project Kitten depends on Project Unicorn and has a question? They no longer go to a certain team member. Instead, they go to the central hub, just like everyone else, and ask a question there. What is the benefit of this way of working? It means that everyone standing around is seeing the question, including people who have the same question but didn't ask dare to ask, and including people who didn't even know that they have that question, but are still interested in the, interested in the answer. On the other hand, it also means that everyone who could potentially contribute an answer has a chance to do so. So you will automatically tap into the knowledge of more than one human being answering that question. Just recently at my workplace, we had a question um, concerning string comparison. It went to a dev list and the person asking the question in the first pla place was very surprised by the extensive answers that re he received, not only on the specification, but also on the specific implementations within the JDK themselves. So asking um, a group of people in that way means that everyone can contribute um, their perspective and you do not receive repeatedly the same answer because people know which knowledge already was shared. Of course, the same can happen the other way around, where Project Unicorn watches Project Kitten, watches their releases and gets involved. So it's very ni a very nice um, way of communicating for sharing information. You don't need uh, synchronous meetings in order to share information. You can do this right, right this, uh, right, very easily in an asynchronous way. We've seen in open source projects that this also works well for motivating people, where by constantly um, sending and reinforcing positively good behavior, um, people can be mentored towards working in a way that um, matches well with the project goal. It can also work very well for giving feedback. Also, doing so asynchronously means you need um, higher communication skills than when doing so in a face-to-face -face manner because you cannot see the reaction of the other participant directly. You see it, um, if at all, with a certain lack of time in between. It can work well for teaching. It can work well for making decisions. But it's harder to resolve conflicts that way, and socializing is even harder. It's archived, it's transparent, but if it's written only, it also means it's low, it's low bandwidth. But there's a nice side effect to this way of communicating. Um, it means that passive documentation is created uh, as a side effect of your day-to-day -day communication. You don't have to sit down and write everything down but you can rely on having a baseline of documentation already there. Think about those questions that you receive over and over. Those are already answered in the archive. Will everyone search the archive for the answer? Clearly not, but still you can link to previous good answers and provide them again without having to retell them or retype them. Now, is that enough in terms of communication channels? We're here at Open Source Summit. That's not a asynchronous and it's not written only. So even in open source projects, we do have additional 
additional communication channels. Which are they? The one with the highest bandwidth is meeting in person. It's great because humans are great at reading faces. However, it's expensive to set up, not only during time of pandemic, but also because they are synchronous in both time and space. Everyone has to have time at the same day during the same time. Think back towards the, um, the brainstorming exercise that I built in into the slide deck. In order for it to be kind of inspiring, it helps to have people fill in the survey at the same time watching each other um, and influencing what everyone else is writing. It does work asynchronously, but it's faster and it's more inspiring and more creative if you do it together at the same time. Which can mean thinking back towards the Apache Software Foundation where you have people in Asia, in Australia, in Africa, in Europe and in America. Someone always has to wake up in the middle of the night in order to participate. Meetings in person are also, of course, expensive to set up because you have to have everyone at the same physical location, so you have to ship people around the globe. Plus, it's not particularly durable. It has to be repeated for every human new to the project. Now, you can tell me that you um, record everything that you talk about, but still, if someone's joining your community as a new member after 10 years, having to re-watch everything that was said within those 10 years, that's not feasible. It's very good for motivating people. It's very good for socializing. And because you see people face to face, it's also great for resolving conflicts. You have immediate feedback. Um, you have an immediate back and forth. There's um, various stories about um, contributors to open source projects that had a conflict with each other that was then resolved either over beverages or over shared meals. It's fairly informal and it's high bandwidth. We can add video chat to that. It's pretty high bandwidth, you still see faces, also likely less body language, but it's still pretty expensive to set up because it needs to be synchronous in time. Plus it needs good technology in order to really work. Plus it's fairly durable. So even if you record all those video chats, having to rewatch them is fairly expensive. If you lower the bandwidth a little more, you can include more people. You can have online group chat. It's rather cheap to set up. It's still kind of synchronous in time because what you send are tiny sentences, tiny bits of information. It needs a decent client in order to work well. It's pretty durable. You can search and skim log, but have you ever tried to deduce architectural decisions from IRC logs or even Slack logs? It's still very hard because it's fairly unstructured. You can add a bit of um, structure to that, create a web forum or mailing lists. It's low bandwidth because it's usually text only, maybe with graphical emojis. It's also cheap to set up, it's asynchronous, it doesn't need any spe special technology. Plus it's pretty durable, you can search, uh, you can follow archived discussions, and typically texts are longer, providing more context. Same with mailing lists and a decent client plus an archive. You can add more structure to that by using the issue tracker. It's asynchronous, it's well structured, and it's fairly, but still it's fairly fine grained because it moves in um, very small um, increments. So it can be very hard to piece together the entire picture of an architectural decision. For that, you can use wiki pages in order to give higher level views, or you can move to something that is very durable, but also takes time to set up, which is to provide a um, web page, which gives higher level overviews, not only for first time users, but also on how to get involved with your project and also on um, what the architecture of your project looks like, what changes look like. So to summarize, what you want to create is one canonical place in order to keep current status 
which can which should be provided as self service. If someone is working on an issue, that they should be made transparent in your issue tracker. You want one canonical place in order to keep documentation, and the goal here is to avoid repeating yourself. Plus, you want one place where you track previous decisions. What you achieve by that is that you provide your project with a long-term memory. So what about the coffee machine chat? What we've replaced so far are all of the formal conversations. What about the deniable informal incidental communications? Head over to the Etherpad um, and think about what which types of ways you found in order to replace coffee machine communications, lunch communications in a remote work setting. Ready, steady, go. Giving you two minutes. Half a minute to go. Okay, now let's head over to step three, scaling decision making through transparency. So far we've looked at teaching, at resolving conflicts, at socializing, setting goals, sharing information, motivating and feedback. We haven't looked at making decisions so far in detail. I will pick one example, which is how to make a meeting with dozens of agenda items, take an hour or less. A lot of this is based on experience I made at the Apache Software Foundation on how they run their board meetings. Okay, what's the secret? The secret is to make agenda items available for reading well ahead of time. And ag agenda items there doesn't mean only bullet points of what we want to talk about. It's really the, the bullet point plus all of the content below so that all of that can be read ahead of time. So you don't have to use precious meeting time just for sharing the information on the content that you want to discuss. This is shared ahead of time. Plus you enable pre-approvals. That means if you go through that agenda, you come up, come to some agenda item, you read all of the text and your brain says, yeah, sure, approved, fine, fine by me, go ahead. You can mark that this as pre-approved and if enough people do that, it won't appear in the meeting because um, enough people pre-approved it, except when someone says, I want to discuss this. So a lot of the items are moved out already ready by this process. Now you ask yourself, certainly there are some items where you have tiny questions. 
where you need a little bit of cl clarification. In order to enable that, you enable asynchronous communication in order to clear questions. If there's a tiny glitch, if there are some misunderstandings that can be cleared asynchronously before the meeting, next agenda item that moves out of the agenda. Now this looks like rocket science, doesn't, doesn't it? Actually, it's not. It's a text file put into version control. This text file essentially is the meeting notes. So you can read through everything that would have happened in that meeting that you know before the meeting happened. Participants can go through and mark um, writing into this text file um, which items they agree with, which items they disagree. Now, because of course the text file for meeting minutes at the Apache Software Foundation is a bit longer than the average letter page, there is a web app on top which reads the text file and which generates the comments. But at the end of the day, it's just a text file. So for communication, what they use simply is a um, teleconference. You can dial into it. There's a video conference part in it um, where you communicate about that. Plus, they go through that text file piece by piece. Of course, again, because it's rather lengthy, there's a web application that helps the secretary go through the meeting where every participant um, can follow the course of the meeting in the agenda um, and where co um, additional comments are being made just in time. Now, in order to keep conversation on the verbal channel, on, on topic and in focus, what they also added is, is, an, is, is a back channel, written back channel, essentially IOC is like whatever, just a chat, where back chatter can happen. All of the socializing, all of the, all of the little jokes, but also all of the little additions, all of the tiny corrections can go to chat where they are being picked up. Now take that to the next level, how to make transparent and open decisions. That's mostly based on things I learned in Apache, but also from the book, The Open Organization. In Open Organization, there is a sentence that um, was really interesting to me. In order to drive engagement and collaboration to the roots of an organization, you need to get people involved in the decision-making process. Okay, makes sense, except that at Apache, we have more than just three people. Let's read on. Well, making ex an executive decision by fiat is fast, but that's when the real hard work starts. Here's the funny thing. You make a decision and then the lengthy change process starts, at the end of which you have finally reached a state where every everyone is working according to their decision. If you manage to engage people in the decision-making process, this change management becomes unimportant. So you start your decision-making process and then you hit the road running. So the funny thing is that the leader's role then becomes making these transparent decisions, integrating everyone, but um, making change management itself superfluous. How does that work? Well, in open source, we do not only open the software. A lot of people would agree with me that simply taking a piece of software that is ready, slapping an open source license to it and publishing it doesn't help very much. Maybe to some extent because it adds to transparency, but where you reap the real benefit is by also opening up the creation process. Opening up architectural decisions as they are being made and opening up towards influence from other players, including your competitors. Now you do the same in your organization when you make decisions. You engage with people, even though it takes a ton of time. You do not only explain what you're doing, but you also explain why you're doing so. Now, if it feels overwhelming at some point in time, likely someone's moving too fast. Making these kinds of transparent decisions and engaging people in this decision-making process takes time. 
However, those slower decisions typically lead to better results. Because as soon as a decision is made, likely a lot of the stakeholders already have been engaged. In order to do that, you enable asynchronous communication in order to prepare consensus. You communicate about a outstanding decision ahead of time and you prepare consensus asynchronously. That means that only those pieces of that decision that are really controversial have to be discussed face to face. So you save precious meeting time for the pieces in the decision where you actually need this precious meeting time. And you can focus on stuff that is controversial. You leverage your soapbox in order to poke and prod on issues that you believe are important. But you also share plans early. And now comes the hard part. You share them even if they are half-baked. Because only that way, in that release early, release often manner, it, it's possible to receive feedback to refine your plan and to make small and reversible steps. You avoid big mistakes, but you make mistakes small and cheap. It also means that you have to create an organization where making mistakes is okay. That way, you inspire other volunteers to become active, to help you out, and to provide their vision and their knowledge and their expertise in your organization. Now, how to do a lot of that is being explained in InnoSource. There is an organization called the InnoSource Commons, which is collecting patterns for collaboration uh, um, and for transparent communication in organizations. It tries to move patterns, how we communicate in open source projects, into organizations themselves. Essentially, what I've once heard people say is where you go for the patterns, but you stay for the community. Careful, it's just one step on a journey. The goal is to train more humans in open source practices. But not only to make those organizations internally more efficient and more innovative, it also means lowering the barrier to get involved upstream. One of the feedbacks that I heard from many people, what is most challenging and frightening is the way we communicate in open source very transparent. Transparent to the point where our communication is public, where all our mistakes are public, where our way of thinking, our way of decision making is public. It takes a certain level of training, a certain level of getting used to, in order to become comfortable with this way of communicating and in order to understand all of the benefits that this communication um, brings with it, including early feedback, including learning, including getting better, including collab collaborating and communicating across boundaries, building bright bridges between organizations that otherwise would not collaborate. So essentially using those practices in-house means teaching people all of the advantages that come with them in order to lower the barrier for them to get involved upstream. And here's the funny piece. It actually works. I do know people who started out working in an inner source project and who then become, became much more comfortable communicating and helping projects in the open source world that they rely on on a day-to-day -day basis in order to get their work done. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time today and I'm happy to take any questions either synchronously in chat or asynchronously afterwards through whatever channel you would like. Thank you and bye-bye.